Great. Welcome to the 24th Annual Capital Conference, Virtual Edition. It is our goal that each session is about an hour in length. However, we may go a little longer or we may go shorter. My name is David Stevens, and I'm the Director of Academics for UIL. Also helping me with this session is Glenda Munoz, Administrative Assistant for UIL Academics. This session is Introduction to the Social Studies Contest. Our presenter is Andy Bates, the Social Studies State Contest Director. Andy, thank you for being willing to share your wisdom and knowledge with our attendees in this new format of Capital Conference. Yes, I'm excited. Uh, I'll share what I got. Um, of course, what's odd, I'm a little more nervous here than I am when the people are actually in the room because uh, uh, I can't see you. So I have no idea what you're doing and that's scary. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started and uh, this is introduction. We do have the more in-depth session coming up that's going to be uh, this Thursday. So definitely come back for that at uh, 2 o'clock, same bat channel, same bat time. And I'll go a lot more in-depth into the, rather than the format, which is what we'll, we'll cover uh, more of today. And I, I will go into some specifics today, but uh, for that one, I'll really get into um, the nitty gritty about why that topic is and how I, I formulated it and, and some of those specifics. So what are we gonna see today? Um, the basics, obviously I wanna cover that just in case we do have some newbies. I know uh, David had mentioned, we definitely have a few. So I don't wanna uh, gloss over that too much. Um, even though I know some of you are very experienced, um, you know, could probably get this session in your sleep, but I do want to make sure we, we at least cover uh, some of that, um, the basics of the competition, but I will go over strategy uh, and I'll try to make that strategy specific to this topic. So it is a little bit novel, even if you've uh, been through the intro sessions in the past. And I'll, I'll definitely talk about types of questions. I, I do have a couple samples. Um, from past topics and, and this topic as well. Um, so I'll talk about those. Um, but again, all of that will be in the next session on a deeper level on Thursday. Uh, and you can see some of the, the other things, there will be an overlap, uh, but uh, the advance will go more into types of questions, whereas this will talk about structure a little bit more. I hope to answer as, as many questions as possible. Uh, so make sure you throw them into the chat and uh, we'll, we'll try to get there. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on the background, my bio, that's there. But what I, I would like is, um, if you're not already, uh, use, use any means you find comfortable, you are comfortable with, uh, to contact me. Um, my email's there and I use Twitter a lot. Um, you may have already seen it where I've, I've done some clarifications or corrections on the tentative list that's on the, the UIL site, uh, just so the information's already out there. Uh, obviously, later in the summer, I'll have like a final list posted, but I do use Twitter to, if I see something or I want a clarification or someone asks me about something in email or something else, I'll go ahead and post it on Twitter as well. So uh, I highly encourage you uh, to follow at Mr. Academics. I do um, polls from time to time about uh, things about the topic or future topics. So um, again, that's probably the best way to do that. I answer emails as much as I can, which is to say I usually get back to them. Uh, sometimes it takes a while because I get inundated with emails, not for social studies, that'd be nice, but for other things. And uh, so sometimes it takes me to the end of the week or even the end of the month when I go back through and I do find one uh, and I'll answer it. But I, I try to be pretty quick about those. So feel free to do that as well. Um, I was going to do like show of hands how many are experienced, but I can't see all of you. So that doesn't really help me get a, a good uh, judge of how many are new or how many aren't. So just if I'm going too fast, throw it down in the chat and say, hey, I'm new. I really need to. Um, hear some more about this that or the other but at the same time uh as david said this is recorded so you'll be able to to go back to it if i do happen to uh blow past something okay so social studies contest this is the history of the history contest although it's not history it's social studies but anyway sounds better if i say history of the history contest uh what we do we pick a topic every year these are all the topics that have ever been covered because the social studies a contest is relatively new. 
Um, of course, it's, it's getting older and older as we go, as are all of us. So, you know, the United States is relatively new to, say, Japan and China. Uh, and so UIL social studies is relatively new to some of the other contests, like, say, debate. Um, and this is a history of the topics you can see right there. Uh, as you can see, we are doing American Empire this year with Honor in the Dust as the book. Um, it didn't always follow a back and forth foreign to domestic topic uh, alternating each year, but uh, it developed into that uh, a couple years in, or I should say maybe five or six years in. And now uh, I have decided that I think that's the best way to do it. So every other year, it will switch between this year is domestic, the next year will be foreign, just like last year was foreign. And so, you know, it goes back and forth in that, um, that vein. It doesn't have to do that, but I find it very uh, useful um, in, you know, focusing on uh, new areas, you know, and, and just on a, a small tangent, you know, this topic itself has elements of, of several previous topics. Um, you know, you, you may notice um, that in the list of terms and in the list of sources, it wasn't um, amazingly heavy, even though it very well could have been, uh, and very well could have been justified to be heavy on uh, interactions and expansions, uh, effects on Native Americans and, and uh, Native tribes in the US. And the reason is, is we, we've covered that before. Of course, you know, now it's getting back seven, eight years, but that was very much covered in depth. So I didn't want to uh, retread that ground too much, even though it is a necessary part of this year's discussion. So this kind of guides me when I pick new topics. Um, I like to try and make them fresh, although um, it's, it's impossible to not cover them a little bit, um, you know, with new topics. And in some ways, I, I kind of like that as well, to have them tie a little bit. So what is competition? Uh, four students per school uh, can enter into the uh, individual competition. Uh, team competition, at least three. You got to have three if you have two, and they are the greatest students ever, and they happen to make perfect scores, then it still doesn't count. So you have to have three. Uh, if you're gonna get that team score, you know, put somebody uh, in there. If you've got those two amazing students, just uh, tell them to, to wake somebody up and, and have them be that third, because that's the only way you can get the, the team. Who advances? You've got your top three individuals will advance from district to state, I mean, to region, excuse me, uh, and then the top three from region to state. All members of the team will advance. So even though three will create that team score and that's how you're gonna be ranked, all four will make it. So whoever just happened to be uh, the low person that day, that doesn't matter. They get to advance with the team and they could be uh, first on the, the next go around when you go from district to region and even to state. Uh, wildcard team also advances. Very briefly, what is the wildcard team? you are the top second place team in a region. So if you got second place in district, you don't advance. But if you are the number one, uh, number two team, number one, number two, if you're the number one, number two, uh, then you will advance to region. And the same thing exi uh, exists at the region level. If you are the top second place team in all the state, then you advance to state as well as the number one team in your area. Really important, I say this every year, uh, I think it's the, one of the best changes to ever come along, even though it's been there for over a decade now. Um, it's just a great um, evolution of the contest because sometimes you're in a district where it's just, you could be the two best teams in the state or you're in a region where you're just battling against these, these great schools and it's just wrong to not have that chance just because you happen to be put in such a competitive district or region to go ahead and advance. Um, when I was a coach, we won state three times before we won region because our region was just that tough. And maybe I was just a slow learner and it took a while. But uh, regardless of the reason, uh, without wildcard, we would never even have gone to state, let alone had a chance, let alone been able to be successful. So I love that, um, the fact that that exists. And uh, it's, it's important to, to be aware of so that you know what your, your chances are and, and how you're competing. 
The test itself, 45 total questions. They're divided into three sections. Uh, we'll go over that. Last year, I uh, changed it up a little bit because uh, of the, the book. And so we, we did a little bit different, not a huge departure, but it was a little bit different. But we've gone back to the traditional one, two, three format this year. Uh, 45 total questions, that's always going to be the same thing. 80 total points, that's always going to be the same. With one essay that is worth 20 points. And of course, uh, if you get that perfect score on both, get 100 because social studies is perfect, uh, then you would be perfect as well. Uh, you may notice there's a correlation there um, between the way current events is set up and uh, social studies in that, you know, 40 points, we have 80, 10 points for the essay, we have 20. Um, does UIL think that the social studies contest is twice as good as the, as the current events? I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying the numbers don't lie either. So uh, also important to remember, got to submit that essay. Okay? If you do not, it results in disqualification, throw some down. We have a, a session coming up um, next week, I believe it is, uh, where uh, the good doctor and I, the current events uh, state contest director, and I will do uh, a full-on essay uh, session, talk about it in depth, uh, and we'll talk about what the difference is between a sincere effort to write an essay and one that, you know, just doubles up as the uh, menu at a Waffle House. So the, we'll talk about that, but you do have to write some sort of essay. Otherwise, your objective score will not count and will not be graded. The top eight objective scores uh, will have their essays graded. They don't grade every single essay out there because uh, that, that would be, uh, that would take a long time. Um, and so they, they leave it to the top eight. So there's a balance there. You could write an amazing essay that just makes, you know, brings people to tears. But if you don't have the objective score that's high enough, no one will get to read it except for the student. So uh, it's important to have both. If there's a tie, I've seen it go all the way to like 14 essays graded because the lowest, uh, the, the eighth, number eight objective score is the same. It's tied between like six or seven people. So that can happen as well. Ranking the individuals to determine first, second, third, so on. Individual place is the objective plus the essay score. Again, that could be up to 100. Uh, the tiebreaker between individuals is the essay. So the essay is not only worth a fifth of all your possible points, it is the way that a, a tie will be broken. It won't be based on um, you know, the percent right or, or anything else that they may use in some of the other contests. It's just going to be the essay. So if you get a 20 and someone else gets a 20, they're going to grab those essays. They're going to look at them just side by side and they say, which one is better? Not going to add a point, not going to subtract a point, just which one is better, even though they both have 20s or both have 10s or whatever the case may be. Um, and that'll determine the tiebreaker. For the team, top three objective scores, like I mentioned before, tiebreaker is uh, the score of the fourth team member. So it's important to have a fourth team member because if you don't, then your tiebreaker is zero. Uh, and, and that generally doesn't win a lot of tiebreakers. So having a fourth member uh, definitely uh, is important for a number of reasons. This is just one of many. And that's all the way to state didn't used to be that way a couple uh, years ago. They didn't break those ties, but we do all the way to state. So that fourth member really can uh, make a difference. All right, so getting into the actual questions, the objective questions uh, in the different sections that they're divided into. Before we go into that, just so everybody knows, this is the best answer. It's multiple choice, but as you can see on the answer sheet here, uh, it's write the letter indicating the best possible answer to each question. The reason that's important is because, you know, sometimes with this subject in particular, things can be subjective. I, I work really hard and I really labor on making questions that are very specific so that the subjectivity is taken out, but I am far from perfect. And so sometimes, in certain interpretations or other things, people might say, you know what, I, I really think this could be correct. Um, and you may be right, 
but is it the best answer? Is it kind of correct and something else is totally correct? Is it you know, uh, correct in a certain time period, but this other answer choice is always correct? Then that, that is going to be the best answer. And so that's why I put that in there. Uh, and it's on the answer sheet, just so people are aware, because that helps uh, settle those disputes and, and um, you know, make those choices when you are dealing with something that is inherent, inherently uh, somewhat subjective. All right, sorry, I thought I skipped over one. So part one, 20 questions, one point a piece, up to 20 points, pretty simple. This is general knowledge and terms. So every year, new list comes out based on the topic and it has people and terms. Uh, it's usually under, well, it's always under 300. I don't think it's ever gone over 300, although sometimes it gets close, uh, but it's uh, divided between the two. Usually uh, the people are a good hefty portion of it, but there's more terms. This year, definitely the people are, are uh, maybe more people than I've ever done, but there's still more terms than there are people. So that's part one. Part two is the book. Now, I mentioned earlier last year, we switched it up a little bit and the book moved to part three. When it, I went back to the traditional format uh, with part two, this book, uh, I think you're going to like it if you haven't started it already. I know I've gotten some feedback already and a lot of people uh, really enjoy it. Uh, you know, last year when we did Korea, it was, for me, I thought it was a really good book because it covered aspects of social studies that are important, but not always covered in our contest from the arts uh, and culture to obviously the politics, the history uh, and other things that we're more used to seeing. Um, and this one gets back to a more just, let's say meat and potatoes version uh, of a historical uh, approach. Um, doesn't mean that it it's, doesn't cover uh, a, a wide range of topics, but it is more uh, traditional and what you might expect uh, from a history book. Very approachable. Uh, I've talked with the author several times. Um, just about his process and I got a lot of feedback from him on the topic overall. Um, he's on Twitter, uh, good guy to talk to, but this will be the second section, two points a piece, 15 questions, so 30 is your max. Part three, uh, again, we, we switched this back to where the supplemental documents uh, are going to be in part three. So there's 10 questions, but they are worth the most of any of the questions. They're worth three points a piece. So the whole section, like the book, is worth up to 30. Uh, the supplemental documents uh, are posted right now. They'll probably get a little tweaked, not much, uh, a little tweaked. I know there's one thing I noticed. Um, one of the, the McKinley speeches is posted on there and it says, because it's printed uh, from an article, an interview that appeared in 1903. Um, so the thing that's interesting about that is McKinley had been dead for two years. So that's, that's may throw you off, but that's, it was printed then. If you look in another source, uh, the Democracy Reader, which I think is a, a, a link that I have on the, the list as well, there's another version of it, and that actually lists the, the original date uh, that it came out in um, 1900. But again, there might be some little tweaks there. I don't expect there to be a lot, uh, if any, and if there are, those will happen um, you know, within the next couple weeks. Uh, August 1st is the hard deadline of, I don't make any changes after that. You know, sometimes uh, if you're dealing with a certain topics, say last year, you know, you're dealing with these countries and their history, their history goes all the way up to modern times, current day even. Um, and I made sure, and I continue to do this, to use that August 1st as a hard date as nothing will appear on the test that happened after that. You know, I don't, we're not the current events test. Um, we're better than that. So we, we want to draw that line there and not, you know, have the two overlap. So August 1st is, is used in a couple ways, one of which I make sure the list is 100% unless there's just a mistake that I missed. Um, so there's no changes after that. And also there would be no information needed to be covered after that. 
All right, uh, on the essay, I'll cover this uh, fairly quickly because, like I said, if you really want to know about the essay, uh, I will be doing a session uh, later on this month with Dr. Wilson about the essay, and we go into a lot of this. I will say that it's important to me um, to talk about the essay just because I find it so essential to the contest. You know, some people love it, some people hate it, some people are, are back and forth on it. Uh, not only is it essential because it, it provides us with a tiebreaker that we wouldn't have otherwise, uh, being able to answer a multiple choice question um, has a lot of luck. So even though it's an objective question, it is subjective in the fact that I thought it was important. You may have looked at that same term, that same person, and deem that particular fact uh, that I'm asking you about not as important. And so it kind of comes down to luck uh, as to did you know that? And also, you could have no clue about it and still get the question right, because there's, there's only four possibilities down there, and you might get it. Whereas on the essay, um, I don't know that I've ever seen someone correctly guess an essay. Uh, if they have, that would be impressive. Um, and so because of that, it, it forces someone who only, only someone who has truly extensive knowledge, as I put there, uh, to, to come out, you know. Uh, is it subjective as far as the judging? Of course, it, it certainly has, or certainly is, but uh, I also believe it takes away some of the subjectivity of the multiple choice by showing that you have to know uh, this topic on a deeper level. Uh, than you would for just a multiple choice. All right, more essay tips. Again, I'll go through this kind of quickly. Read the prompt, read it carefully, read it several times. Uh, then once you think you've got a hold of it, read it again. Make sure you look at all aspects of it. When you look at the rubric for the judges grading that essay, it will ask, did it cover social, political, uh, cultural, economic, all the different areas there? So if your students aren't looking at that and you're not studying those aspects, then you're not approaching uh, the essay to its entirety uh, or you're not respecting it, uh, the, the topic in its entirety, so to speak. So make sure you have a thesis. That's another part. We'll look at the rubric in just a little bit. Without the thesis, it's going to kind of limit you. You could have a great uh, essay. Again, it could just, you know, make the, the, the doves cry. But if it doesn't have a thesis, some people are just going to mark you very far down. And based on the rubric, they'd be somewhat, somewhat justified. Okay? Uh, and make sure you answer the question as asked. You know, you may think my essay is horrible. You may be right. Um, doesn't mean that answering a separate question is going to somehow uh, get you points. Um, you know, you have to answer the question and usually i try to break that question down into a, a pointed area uh, for discussion you've got to cover that my classic example i had someone write just an amazing essay about fdr and just so much information um could have been very useful you know in in a, a college course a seminar on fdr to get everybody up to speed but it asked specifically about his first 100 days and there was very little in that and so one judge looked at it and it's like oh this is great and then the other judge noticed you know they really didn't address the specific prompt and so after conferring the judges kind of cut that score in half real quick okay. all right so here is the prompt and what it looks like okay this is what actually shows up and again it reminds everybody contestants who do not write an essay will be disqualified it has to demonstrate a sincere effort. So again, you can restate the topic. You're not going to get any points really, but at least you won't get uh, disqualified if you restate it and say, this is very important and should be discussed. Um, and so that reminds everyone of it right there. This is an actual example of a essay or an essay that uh, I wrote. Uh, this was to be on the regional test that did, did unfortunately uh, not take place. So you can see, I always follow this. I have a quote, and then from that, I go to a question based on that quote. So I give some background information there. I, I don't wanna just throw a question out there that doesn't have context. 
So I do that and then we can look at each part. Again, this is the um, specifics. Uh, I'd like to make sure everybody knows you've got to write it. And then this is the actual uh, prompt, or not prompt, I'm sorry. This is the quote that I used um, talking about Japan and its uh, foreign relations and goals uh, through the Meiji Restoration uh, all the way uh, to the, the next imperial period. Um, and so it takes a quote. This one was from one of the books that I used as kind of a, a background guide for the topic last year, which I'll show you guys a bunch of books that I've been reading and that I'm using uh, in the next uh, session that I do, the advanced one. I've got some great books uh, that I, I, I've already put them out on Twitter, at least most of them. I'll, I'll bring some more for the, the discussion on Thursday. Uh, but again, another good reason to look at Twitter. I talk about some books that I find very helpful and that are, that are going to frame the way I look at this topic and they have framed the way I've created this topic. So it's always good to, to know that going in. You don't have to use them, um, but it's just another um, tool to have in, in your bag there. Uh, so anyway, this came from a book that I had used last year as uh, a basis for creating the topic. And then from that quote, you get the actual question, the intense and rapid revolution associated with Meiji Restoration is arguably unparalleled in human history. Domestic reform may have been more transformative, but the dramatic developments in foreign relations surpassed the most well-known change of the era. Trace the evolution of Japan's international status from the era of unequal treaties to the end of the Meiji period. So notice what I've done there is Meiji is huge. There are books, large books, just on the Meiji Restoration. So in this question, I specifically tried to eliminate domestic reform, which the change, for those of you who did last year's topic, and when you studied this, the change undergone by uh, Japan culturally and, and, and in their society, again, could be its own book uh, and, and is um, in several forms. So I had to cut all that out uh, for this question because I wanted it to be more specific to just about the foreign relations. And then I gave it a time period uh, from the beginning to the end. So there's a lot of information from the quote to the question itself, even if you feel like you're not 100% uh, sure about that topic, it, I try to guide you to have some, some idea of where to go with it. So that's, that's uh, how they always show up. Uh, obviously, they change from, from test to test, but that's the same format that you're going to see. Okay. Uh, rubric, just going through this uh, quickly, for those of you who are 100% uh, green, this is what the essay rubric looks like. If you notice here, six to 10 lacks a thesis. So if you have elements up here where it has, you know, it's well-written, it's organized, it interprets, but it lacks a thesis, chances are a lot of judges are going to keep you down in that bottom half of the possible points. Okay? Uh, one of the things I always like to point out to people is it's not meant to be an uh, English paper. It's not meant to be judged on uh, your ability to be grammatically correct, um, but yet it's going to be on some level. So the most important part is the information and the analysis. But if your analysis becomes garbled and your message becomes unclear because your grammar or even your, you know, the legibility of your writing uh, makes it difficult, then you can expect that to impact your score. So again, you, it's not supposed to be based on that, but we're all human beings. We all have uh, these built-in uh, limitations. And so when those problems in clarity occur, then they can cost you. But again, at the end of the day, we're trying to focus on information and analysis uh, as the most important part. Right? Again, I'll, I'll go through this um, just very briefly. You know, I, I think I kind of said this already. Um, you have 90 minutes. This is an important thing for the entire 
test. That means objective and essay. You can take as much time on either one as you want, um, but you, you, that should be more than enough time to do them and to outline your essay before you write it, to think about it before you write it. Uh, and so it, it should be enough time. Uh, if you use it wisely, because the objective portion just generally doesn't take that long, um, or at least that large of a chunk in comparison to what the essay takes. So plan ahead for that. Um, don't rush through the objective portion, because otherwise, if you don't get your points there, essay will never get graded. But make sure you have enough time to organize, think out, plot your essay before it's written. Skip to the end. Uh, I like to say, read the essay as soon as you get the test, as soon as you're allowed to go. Tell your students, read that essay and start thinking about it. Not directly, don't start planning it out, but let your brain work on it. Uh, it's amazing how much work your brain can do without you being aware of it. And this is part of that. If you let it, uh, you know, percolate, as I said, if you let it marinate, so to speak, uh, in your mind, then when you actually get to it after the objective portion is done, uh, it's amazing how much the ideas will just start to flow. Uh, whereas if you waited to read it until you were done with the objective, then there's, there's kind of this freak out period. There's kind of this, I don't know what to do. Uh, so this does dull the impact. The test questions that you see they might not specifically give you information, but they might remind you of information that you could use in the essay. So, you know, tell your students, write those down as they come to them. So I always, always, always say, you know, read the prompt, the essay first before you take the objective, uh, because you're going to want to read it several times. Always reread that prompt to make sure you've got it. And when you write that essay, it actually addresses that prompt specifically. Best way to do that is to read it several times and best way to reread it is to start first thing with with getting one out of the way before you go to it after the objective all right possible essay question areas now when i go uh into the advanced session i'll do this more in depth but this definitely uh is going to be some overlap there i'll just talk about it more in the other session uh people this could be from the terms obviously uh, but it's only going to be the the really big people you're not going to have an essay on some of these minor people that did something significant but were not known for multiple significant events uh and the book certainly has uh, some people uh that could show up in fact these key figures that i've listed here are just from the book so what I did is I just, I briefly looked at the book and I was like, who are the top suspects uh, that would show up in an essay uh, based on their presence in the book? Presidents, there's a lot of them in the book that, that could show up. Uh, also key commanders, as, as you have some listed there. Uh, Aguinaldo for sure. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge definitely could, could get one. Um, you know, when we say say presidents, obviously, in relation to the book, we're talking McKinley and TR uh, topping the list, but Taft, uh, because he had so much to do with this topic, uh, or the book, I should say, specifically in different ways, not just as president, uh, but in fact, more so before he was president. Uh, but you could also see some of these uh, people that I have listed here that maybe don't play as prominent in a role uh, in the book from beginning to end, but are significant when they are covered. And that William Jennings Bryan, for sure, the uh, election of 1900, and I mentioned that uh, down here. Uh, sorry about that, my pointer went away. All right, the election of 1900, that would go with William Jennings Bryan. They might be uh, put together in a topic. Albert uh, Beveridge, you've probably seen him in section three, if you've looked at the, the topic at all, he's, he's in section one and he's in the book. So anytime you see overlap between the sections, they have a really good chance of showing up in an essay. Um, groups and interactions for sure, you know, how uh, these different people affected each other or played off each other, you know, Lodge and TR's uh, relationship, that could be huge. Um, you know, and even Root as well, uh, Root, Lodge, and TR, how they uh, responded to the war atrocities uh, scandal, uh, or even, you know, how they uh, framed U.S. policy in general. You could see that. 
Um, and then any of them individually could show up there, but they generally have to be pretty important to show up alone. Um, groupings uh, do happen very often though. As far as major events and movements, again, if there's overlap, if you see it in the terms and it's in the book and it's talked about in one of the documents or events of section three, red flag, you know, uh, bell should be going off as, oh, I should write this down. This could show up as an essay topic in some form or another. Examples of that from the book would be uh, the anti-imperialism movement, the buildup to the war, and uh, in that regard, I'm talking about the Spanish-American War, not the uh, Filipino War. Uh, General Orders 100 uh, could be its own topic for sure, uh, and then going down further into actual um, events, as previously mentioned, election of 1800, uh, the Philippine War by itself, you know, the major uh, events or how it progressed, um, maybe even how it played domestically, uh, and the Cuban campaign, uh, which the, the first half of the, the book deals with in, in some detail. Just in general, and again, I'll give more specific examples of this in the next session, uh, it's, essay could be anything that's a major event, a major person. How will it be written? How will you have to talk about that event or person? It's probably going to be a cause and effect or compare and contrast. You know, some, this person uh, approached uh, imperialism this way, or this person approached expansionism this way. Uh, compare that with someone else or compare that with uh, how it was done previously. Uh, although it doesn't have to be that, like I said, the bigger they are, uh, the better chance that that event uh, just stands alone. And in fact, going back to the example I had in Japan, it's not just going to stand alone, but I'm going to have to cut it down to a very specific part of that person or that event or that issue to talk about because it is uh, such a massive topic. Point is to encourage thinking analysis. So you always want to have analysis in that essay, not just as the, the uh, rubric specifically says, not just a shopping list of facts, okay? Uh, it should have a specific focus, I've shown that. Uh, and I'm gonna make sure that there's a lot of stuff to write about. Even with it being specific, I'm gonna hack it down to where you don't have to write about uh, this massive amount of information, but I'm still gonna leave you with enough to fill two, three, four pages if you wanted to. You don't have to. But I, I want to give you a topic uh, in the essay that gives you enough. You're not scraping the bottom of the barrel to come up with ideas to, to write about. All right, reviewing the basics before we get to uh, sample questions. We've got uh, 80 perfect on the objective, 20 perfect on the essay. We'll keep it 100 and then top eight objective scores will be graded. Uh, more if there's ties. Uh, and then the essay is going to break those ties. Remember, you gotta have a, a blend. You have an amazing essay that no one ever reads, or uh, you, know, you could have uh, this uh, objective score that's really great and maybe even close to perfect, but because your essay doesn't come through, you make it to the top eight, but you don't close. You know, so there, there's definitely a balance needed. Tiebreaker for the team is that fourth place. If there is a fourth, goes all the way to state, and then, um, can't read what's there because my little thing came over it. But you can, so I'm going to hope that it's not that important because you can read it. All right, moving on. Section one questions. This is what everybody likes to see is what are the questions actually uh, going to look like? What form are they going to take? I'm not going to go to this because um, you guys can do this. This is just a link to the list. Uh, if you look at it, like I said before, there's um, a lot more people than there generally are. I wouldn't say a lot more, but there are more, let's put it that way. Uh, because this, this topic uh, covers a lot of, of time, and so there's a lot of different things that were done, and I thought that the people in groups was important. Uh, definitely a lot of events. Um, this could be you know, about the average for people, um, just because I, I try to include those uh, people that were significant and made huge contributions but we don't know about as much. I mean, that was kind of the whole impetus behind this book is, you know, a lot of people know about, obviously, how the country expanded. A lot of people know about imperialism uh, and the Spanish-American War. Not near as many people know about uh, the Philippine-American War 
that followed that. And so it's the same thing with some of these people is they did some things that were very important that set up a lot of uh, the history that followed and a lot of the cultural changes that followed, but we may not have heard of them. So I do like to include uh, as many people as possible, but terms is still always going to be more. There's going to be more terms uh, than people every time, but I do like to try and throw the, the number of people to what I feel is the highest it can be. Uh, but generally you're going to have terms and terms and terms just because one term can encompass, you know, hundreds of people or dozens of significant people. So there's always going to be more terms just based on that. All right. Section two questions that come from the book. Um, the, the book, as I just said, is specific. It's not about the entire topic. That's something that has been done in the past and could be done. But just like last year with Korea, instead of all of East Asia, it focused on one part. So you get up close and personal and see some of those details that you might have missed uh, otherwise with a more general book that covers the entire topic. Same way here. We're dealing with Spanish-American War and then specifically focusing on the Philippine situation following that. Uh, and so it's going to... Section two is gonna, gonna cover that and give it a, a extra special look there. Um, the very unique situation that existed where some people thought Philippines could be uh, becoming a state. If you look at maps from the 19-teens, like 1912, 1916, you look at US maps and you know we're north, uh, used to seeing Alaska and Hawaii offset, they would have the Philippines offset there as well. Not all of them did, but some of them very much did because people were uh, in some camps very excited about the Philippines being added as actual uh, acquisition, 100% moving into possible statehood. Other people, significant uh, parties of people, were very much against that for a wide range of reasons from, from one end of the spectrum to another. But again, it's uh, interesting uh, to see that part of our history, and so that's why um, I, I chose it, and those are what the questions are going to reflect. It's not going to uh, center on the minutia of the battles, so it won't be, you know, the reason that uh, the attack on Kettle Hill was not as uh, quickly one as possible is because the left flank was left exposed uh, due to artillery being, you know, lost in the mud. It, it's not going to have that it will definitely talk about battles. It will definitely talk about what they caused or what they opened up or what uh, brought them to occur, but it, it won't be on, you know, how many men were here and how many men were here. Uh, that's, that's not to me as, as important as some of the other issues. Um, that's why I like this book. It doesn't overly uh, address that. It does include it. It certainly gives you uh, play by play, but it's not a military history. It's a overall history. So it covers the military aspects, but it also uh, covers the social and political issues. This is a magnifying glass on that specific detail. And that's generally what I like uh, about the book. There's a, another book that I already posted on Twitter a couple weeks ago. Uh, written by a Dr. Nugent of uh, Notre Dame. And I, I had the um, pleasure of being able to discuss his book with him recently. And it is great. It is amazing. And it covers the span of American empire. Uh, and so it, it's really good as a resource to cover this entire topic. But the reason I picked this book and the reason I generally pick books is to focus on one part of the topic. And that's exactly what this does. And so the questions you see in section two uh, will reflect that. Section three related to the documents. These are the different documents we have. I'll go into more in depth about types of questions for, for these in the, the next uh, session. But obviously, you know, the order that they happen, that's a very simple one. Uh, who they involved as far as people and countries, uh, whether it be treaties or, um, you know, the speeches and what they talked about. Supreme Court cases, uh, if you've done the contest in the past and you've seen how those questions have shown up, they'll be very similar to that. If you haven't, it talks about, you know, what was the main issue or constitutional um, principle at play in that court, in that case, uh, who made the major decision or, you know, famous uh, 
findings or precedents from those court cases, um, you know, the parties involved. Uh, that's that's the type of questions you'll see in the objections section of section three. Um, the documents, what I really like, and I'm not going to go to these sites because they're listed A here, uh, and you can go back and look at this, but they're also uh, on the the social studies document online on UIL. But these are very helpful um, to find some of the information I'm talking about. Uh, our documents is a great site. It gives some context as well uh, to the document. So that's important. Be aware that context could be part of the question in section three. It's not just the words in the speech or in the legislation, but also the people behind it and where it occurred and when it occurred. So context is, is good. Um, on the American YOP site, it doesn't give as much context, although it does give some, but uh, it's a good place to find, especially those primary sources that were on the list, some of those letters that you saw from uh, the people that were uh, pioneers uh, and, and others. That's a, a source that has a lot of those. Supreme Court cases, as I, I mentioned on the last sl slide, the questions are going to be about what issues were involved, what the decision was, uh, and the major individuals that took part in that. Uh, I didn't mean to do that, but that is one of the sites to go to there. Uh, I forgot, I, I did list a couple there. Oyez is great, uh, the Cornell site is great to get those uh, bits of information that I was talking about, about the cases that are listed in section three. All right, this is the part that everybody tends to really want. See how I write questions, which if you've experienced, I, I generally have a, a style that I stick to, or at least I think I do. Uh, you know, everybody's the hero of their own journey, so I probably don't have a style, and I just, I just think that, but I try to keep it about the same. This is uh, an actual question uh, from, again, that uh, regional test. Uh, the phantom test <laughs> that exists out there in the ether, but we didn't get to actually see. So I, I took this from there. What's the best uh, example of a question than one I actually wrote for a test this year? So obviously this isn't this year's topic, although uh, if you've read the book, you'll notice there's some overlap here. Um, and so normally this is when I get to see who's read the book or not by who can answer questions or who remembers last year's topic but I can't see you. So I'm just gonna assume everyone knows it because you guys are just on it, um, but that would be the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and so you can see how I try to give, and this is one of the longer questions. Um, I try to keep them a little bit shorter than this generally, but part of the reasons they tend to get a little longer is I wanna make sure they're 100% can be narrowed down to one choice and not multiple choices. Uh, as I said, if you've read the book, you know the Boxer Rebellion actually uh, is covered in this book. So it was part of last year's topic and this year's topic, though, from an obviously completely different perspective this time around. So uh, that's an example of a question that you could see over an event, um, asking specifics. If you know when it happened, chances are you're going to be able to answer this. Even if you don't know any of the other details, you're going to be able to answer this just because you know when, um, but you don't have to know when to answer that question. And so you'll see those kind of formats uh, a lot. All right, another example is, all right, so this is from this year's topic. Throw it out there. Uh, and again, this is where I really like to see like who knows it and who doesn't. Although again, this is, this is not the most difficult question in the world. Uh, although I'm sure there's some of you uh, sitting there saying it's not. Uh, but I'm going to assume you all know it. You got it. Uh, the Donner Party is infamous for the uh, tragic circumstances suffered while attempting to reach blank territory during the winter of 1846-1847. Uh, it's because they took the Hastings cutoff, which is supposed to be a shortcut, and it was uh, if you, you're final destination was literally your final destination and death was what you were trying to go to, it was definitely a shortcut. Got you there quick for a lot of people, but it was supposed to be a shortcut to California, California territory, um, and didn't turn out well for a lot of people. All right, so what questions will you not see? Those are some, that's a term example, because Donner Party is one of the terms, and so that's, uh, 
basically how I would address it, you know, a key fact about it. And then you have to know uh, not just that it was the Donner Party, because that would be the easier version of that. If I just said, these people died uh, on their way to the California Territory, what was this group known as? Well, Donner Party is going to be pretty easy to answer. So I'll go a, a step further and ask something a little more specific, such as where were they headed, and as you saw with that. All right, so don't expect anything overly just basic. Uh, what U.S. Secretary of State was most responsible for the signing of the hay one of Varela Treaty, the uh, hay Hernan Treaty, and the hay Poncevo Treaties. If you don't know that one, luckily I don't get to see your faces to, to be able to tell that you don't know it, so you can, you can hide that shame. Obviously, John Hay uh, being the answer there. I'm not, or I'm going to try, to not give the answers away in the information. I'm going to give a lot of hints, a lot of information, so that even if you didn't know that fact specifically, you could figure it out based on what you do know. But I'm going to really try hard not to give away the answer in the question. So don't expect that. Other things not to expect, and this is an example from last year, uh, Torotomi Hideyoshi invaded Korea with how many troops in 1592? Uh, for those of you who are just on your game and still remember from last year, the answer is 156,000. But I'm not going to ask those kind of detailed questions. Like I mentioned with the military and battle minutia, it's I may use a number in the question, but I won't be asking for a specific number like that unless it, it's a very just famously specific number. Uh, so here's an example from this year's topic. Um, presidential election of 1900, William McKinley secured a victory over William Jennings Bryan in the popular vote by a margin of, again, I'm not going to ask that, okay? Uh, the answer is, for those of you uh, looking to know this detail, uh, is 6.2%, um, which is significant, uh, but not as big as some people um, may have thought. But again, I'm not going to ask that. Um, it would have to be something more along the lines of, you know, a surprising state that, that was lost by William James Bryan, which I, they don't even go into that kind of detail in the book. But that, that would be the only thing to, to get that kind of detail in an, in an election. All right, another uh, question that you will not see, according to Honor, in the dust beginning in late September, uh, Father Donato Gimbalibo of Panagiga, which I know I'm not saying that name right, but uh, no longer turned up to play nightly what games with US officers. Uh, if you remember that, good from the book. If you don't, it's, it, it, that's okay. I'm not gonna ask things like that, you know. Uh, what color was his hair? Um, what was his favorite flower? You know, those, unless, you know, he made his life's work out of, you know, writing poems about his favorite flower and is known throughout the world for that, you're not going to see those kind of details. So those are just things to, to know um, you don't need to waste your time focusing on. All right, so just looking at the test overall, these are the, the number of questions that I write. So the terms, I write 100 questions on the terms. There's well over 200 terms. So some of them are never going to get a question. Obviously, I, I combine them sometimes. But even with that, uh, some of them are never going to see the light of day there. But they're still important to study so that they inform your knowledge of the topic and your understanding of some of the terms that do show up. Uh, and also, if it's a big enough term, it might show up multiple times. So it's not like if you see a question show up on the set A test, over, you know, James K. Polk, you can just mark him off and say, well, he's never going to have a question over Polk again. Not the case. Could certainly show up again. Section two, that's the book. So there's 75 pages from the book. This book has more than enough information, a wealth of information to supply 75 solid questions so that I don't have to just deal with minutia. And then section three, there's only 50 questions there. There's almost 50 documents. So there's more than enough there uh, without having to uh, just find the nitty gritty and instead questions over larger ideas and also combinations of uh, documents or ideas from the documents. 
A lot of matching their individual uh, that you see on the term to where they're from. Could be country. Um, obviously, this is a domestic topic, but still there are, uh, we're talking about expansionism, we're talking about imperialism, so there are a lot of countries involved here. Uh, certainly what state they're from. Generally, if that's important, um, it wouldn't just be, you know, one of the figures that they list in the book, a lieutenant uh, that was involved in a certain operation and happened to be from Kentucky. Unless that, you know, the Kentucky was then subsequently named for that lieutenant, you know, they're their place of birth is not going to be as important. But identifying people with the country or, or state that they represented, uh, that would be much more important. The party that they represented, the positions that they had, could be one position or I like to list, if you have any experience, you've seen it, I'll list two or three or four things that a person did and then you have to identify which person did those uh, or held all of those positions. Secretary of State, member of the House of Representatives, and President of the United States, you know, things of that nature. Issues related to specific events, so where they happened, why they happened, and then I'm all about firsts, but also lasts. You know, the last time the US did this, the first time um, a president ever did this, the first person um, to claim this area for a country. Um, obviously not the first time someone stepped foot there because we don't know, but some people do like to claim that they were the first ones. Uh, timeline would be the same thing uh, that I listed with uh, accomplishments or positions someone held. I like to list four, and then you have to put them in order. Um, so the order in which these things took place is important, but again, it's gonna be major events if I do that. It's not gonna be, you know, um, uh, the, the day that Monroe issued the Monroe Doctrine, he ate breakfast, he read a book, then he said hi to his wife. What order was that? No, it, it's going to be the, the very large issues, generally terms. Cause and effect questions are huge. You're going to see those a lot. Uh, evolution of, you know, different ideas, especially here from intervention is a good one to trace. Obviously, imperialism and then, you know, how one expansion uh, or step of expansion led to the other. And then exceptional situations, that refers back to, like I mentioned, with firsts, lasts, only. This is the only person to ever do this. This is the only time this has ever happened. The only treaty that was between these two countries. That's my exceptional situations. That's what that means. All right, just to review the competition overall, there are a lot of in invitational tournaments generally in non-pandemic years i don't i can't predict the future uh so that could happen may not happen but uh there definitely uh, should be some virtual opportunities for that uh the virtual challenge meets and best of texas is a way to do that and so I, I highly recommend those because it's it's to me it's fun it's a way to gauge how you're learning and you can compete you don't have to compete but just to see okay on the first test i did this on the second test i did this that helps you, you know, judge how uh, your kids are doing, how you're doing. Um, but remember, the only official tests are uh, district, region, and state, other than the two invitational, set A, set B. So the only five that I write. So if it's a test, and you really don't like the question, and it asks a very specific uh, number, and you said, you told me you wouldn't do that. You lied to my face. You told me in the Zoom that you wouldn't do that. I don't write all the tests, so someone might do that. However, generally for set A, set B, district, region, and state, everything I've talked about today uh, should apply. Uh, I know I'm getting close to the hour, I'm, I'm right there. So I'm just gonna go over this quickly. This is all about how you can get people involved and this is not unique to social studies. You'll find this for pretty much any activity, uh, certainly any UIL academic activity, uh, but look through these different areas to try and get people uh, Start early, you know, uh, we always used to do a, a boot camp uh, in July or late July where we'd get kids up uh, thinking about the topic. You know, some of you have probably already sent books to your kids. Others, you know, when you're, you're just starting out, you may not have thought about it, but get that book to them now. Even if they don't read it, at least they're thinking about it a little bit. You know, you may start to do a reading schedule in the summer. That may be a little aggressive for you, but at least talk to them about it. Get them, get it percolating. 
mind, just like we talked about with the essay topic, have it working in the back of the mind. So when they see something on TV, when they read something, when they're on the internet and something comes up that does deal with the topic, they're more likely to key in and think about it than they would be if you just didn't even mention the topic. So even that, even uh, that slight introduction without actually saying, yeah, we're going to meet together and we're going to do this and we're going to talk about this. It, it can help. It makes a difference. Um, so all the rest of this is basically just ways to prepare. So you can look at this. Uh, I'll go through it so that you can refer back to it when it is, uh, when you look at the recording, but I'm not going to talk about it specifically so that we can get to questions. Do we have any questions? We do. We have a few. Uh, one first question I have on my list is when is the reading list terms and terms finalized? So uh, what's out there right now is I would say 99% good. Uh, August 1st will be hard and fast. There will be no changes after that. Um, so the, the only, I only have one change other than a couple corrections. I think uh, I misspelled uh, Hastings' first name. It's Lansford, not Leonard. You know, there's, there's a couple things on there. Um, I think there's only one change I've looked at so far of making, which I'm probably going to nix Ira Allen as a person. Uh, just because I don't think there's enough information to cover what I'm interested in for this topic. But I may add the Vermont Republic as a term to kind of cover that area instead. Um, but those things, I'm hoping actually to, to get all that done by the end of this month. But 100%, whatever gets put up there by August 1st will be set in wet cement. There was a, there were a there was a question about where the documents are posted and someone had answered and put the uh, academics uh, social studies web page on there. So hopefully everyone saw that. Um, yes. But um, that's where that'll be. There was also yeah, some discussion those, about, go ahead. A lot of those um, links are where you're going to find um, good versions of, of those documents listed for section three. Um, there was also a discussion, a little bit of discussion back and forth through some participants about Douglas MacArthur versus his father, Arthur MacArthur in the Philippines, and everybody sort of, the content was it's about the one in the Philippines, but then there was a question about wondering if the focus is on the elder uh, in the Philippines, the elder's yeah. actions in the Philippines would, how this would affect the younger MacArthur that shaped his actions and beliefs, anything like that. Which is, uh, I mean, certainly a worthwhile topic to discuss, but just to limit it for us, it is Arthur MacArthur. Um, just the greatest name in history right there. But that's who we're going to talk about because the book deals with Arthur MacArthur's actions extensively. Uh, whereas Douglas MacArthur's actions um, are not as pertinent to this particular topic. Uh, certainly an influence on the Philippines, but not in the ways that, or as much in the ways that we're looking at. Will you double the numbers for individuals when you use the randomizer? Yes, uh, and that's something that uh, I generally discuss. I think it's it's 100% in my other presentation, my advanced one. But yes, that's what I normally do. For those of you not familiar, what they're referring to is I randomize uh, the all the terms and people. I assign them a number, and then I put them in a randomizer, and that's how I write my questions for the test. I just, they give me 20 numbers, and I figure out what 20 those were, but I assign two numbers to each person. So they are twice as likely to show up in my randomizer as a term. Another question is, can you give us some, some sorts of the contextualization issues the essays might cover? That's, that's a pretty in-depth, uh, something to look at, but just a, a very, in a nutshell, because uh, I will go into this in more detail in the next session, but it's it's going to try and look at separate eras is one way to do it. Uh, how one era compares to the other, um, you know, and how that some of the social issues, and this is where I, I may draw in the, the documents from section three to give uh, the social context that the events were happening. So I may give like a war or an entire era and ask the, about the context, the, the social um, 
framework that existed that caused that era to happen the way it did. Then is, do you have a suggested way or strategy to use that would have students approach the terms, people, book, and documents as they begin preparations? Yes, and this, I think there's a slide in here that I may have skipped, but it's definitely in the, the other section. I always say three, two, one. So start with section three, go over the, the documents that you have there, because even though it's, it looks like a long list, that's, that's relatively finite. And just the, the details over that is actually a lot easier to comprehend and get a fence around, so to speak, than all of the people and all of the terms and the facts about them in section one, and even more finite than all the details in the book. So start with section three, then move to the book, because again, if it's not within, you know, this cover to this cover, it's not going to be in section two. So there's, again, an easy way to limit what you have to know about in section two. Section one does not have the same verifiable limits because there's so many people in terms and each person is a veritable cornucopia of details and trivia and facts that you could get lost in, uh, just rabbit holes you can go down. So start with section three, it gives you a framework. Section two, there's overlap, so it'll help you understand the book more after you've learn section three and then the terms they'll make a lot more sense because you have that foundation of the documents and then the book instead of just learning about these random people and events that you don't have or your students don't have context for now you do because you've learned the uh, information from section three two and then one can you yeah, go over I again always, i always recommend that I, I wish i had gone over that a little bit more but i know i was running uh, over in time. Can you uh, recommend again which websites you favor with one point questions also overall with three point questions? Yeah, if you the easy answer is, is look on the list look on the UIL terms list because those sites that I put are the ones I'm going to use the most section one the easy answer is I'm going to go to Britannica a lot like I mean, I'm going to try and find information on Britannica however it may not have a uh, an entry or it may not have quite enough so i'll go beyond that and there's info please and there's encyclopedia.com but again all those are listed on the terms list at the end uh on or not at the end i'm sorry in between the the documents page and the terms page i have a bunch of websites listed and the same goes for uh section three i try to list as many sources as possible for finding those documents that i'm talking about in section three Great. Thank you very much. That's all the questions we have, Andy. We have one other thing. Some more things will clear up after we stop the recording, but I want to make sure you don't have anything else you want to add before we do that. No, uh, as always, I know I talked way too long, but uh, I do appreciate you guys listening. Um, and, you know, for those of you I could see pretending to stay awake, but uh, Thursday, I really do look forward to it because I really want to like, you know, dive into this topic and, and tell you kind of why it is what it is and how, you know, the journey of, of how it got there. Because I think that'll really help you understand how you can approach it and how your kids can approach it as well. Great. Thanks for doing this for us. No problem.